Temperatures were nearing 90 degrees on a humid day near Conway, South Carolina on August the 17th, 2018. A man in a dark, long sleeve shirt, long, dark pants, and a dark knit skull cap was waiting behind a house, trying to find some shade, passing time. As he smoked cigarette after cigarette, he would take a butt from each one and stash it in his shoe. He couldn't afford to leave a single one behind. A pistol weighed heavily in his pocket. Three hours passed before a white Ford Escape started up the driveway and the assailant moved into position. Once the vehicle parked, two men got out, a father and a son. They were returning from a local restaurant and one was carrying a takeout bag with freshly made potato chips and two orders of ranch dressing. They had had a good day together. And then the man stepped out from behind the house and leveled the pistol right at the father's face. A shot rang out and the father fell. The son turned to run, but within a step or two, the man was on him. A heavy revolver was shoved under his chin and another shot rang out. The young man fell. Moments passed and the killer walked past the father's body. The father was shot again, this time execution style through the back of the head. The men's wallets were taken and their pockets cleaned out. Their cell phones were left at the scene. The man hopped in a Ford Escape, turned it on and drove away. Who had killed Robert and Robbie Ford on that hot, sunny day and why? Join us as we look into this sordid case and the detective that went to work finding justice for the men. Before we begin, we would like to extend our deepest sympathies to the family and loved ones of Robert and Robbie Ford. It wasn't until later that afternoon that local police in Horry County, South Carolina received a call of a vehicle abandoned in a field off of Cook's Circle in Nichols, South Carolina. When they arrived on the scene, they found no driver in the area and the windows of the vehicle were blackened from the inside. Opening the vehicle, they could tell that the interior had been set on fire, but with the windows up, the fire had burned itself out. As officers were on the scene there, another call came in requesting a welfare check at the home of Robert Ford. The person said they had heard gunshots and perhaps a scream. Officers from the Horry County Sheriff's Office arrived on the scene a few minutes later, finding the bodies of two men there. Chief Deputy Coroner Tamara Willard was able to quickly identify the men, noting that the younger man, Robbie, had been rolled over onto his back apparently after his death, probably to make it easier to go through his pockets during what seemed to be a robbery. As that crime scene was cordoned off, officers investigating the abandoned car some 19 miles away were alerted of the killings. The abandoned vehicle had been owned by Robbie Ford. Around the vehicle, officers could find three cigarette butts and a fresh footprint. What could have been nothing before, except perhaps clues to a theft and an arson, would now be the only clues to who may have been the culprit in the broad daylight double murder. Inside the vehicle, everything had been torched and damaged by the fire. In the floorboard, however, there was a knit skull cap that had only been partially scorched. The skull cap would contain a few stray, long gray hairs, undamaged by the fire. These hairs and cigarette butts would be sent off to the state crime lab for testing. DNA on the cigarette butts and the hair would match each other. The results, however, would not match anything in the state's DNA database. There were victims to the crime, there was evidence, but there were no credible suspects. No one had seen the killings or anyone driving to or from the house. No one had seen the white escape being driven into a field or being set on fire and they didn't see anybody leaving the scene. Who could have killed these two men and why? Was it a simple robbery that had gone wrong? The two men's wallets had been taken as well as the car, but there were no signs of any attempt to break into the home. Would someone have come all that way just to steal a couple hundred bucks and not get the valuables, including a number of guns from inside the home? Horry County, South Carolina is located in the easternmost portion of the state. Just over 300,000 people make their permanent home there. Robert Ford was nearing retirement and had done fairly well for himself. He had a modest home and a good nest egg saved up for retirement, but no extravagant signs of wealth. 
He also didn't seem to have any enemies in the area. He was active in his church, teaching Sunday school, and was even a member of a local gospel singing group, the Good Hope Quartet. His second wife, Melda, had passed away some time before, and he was living alone while his son was away at Clemson University. 25-year-old Robbie was planning on driving back to school at Clemson the very next day as classes were set to begin for the fall semester. An architecture student, he had graduated from a local community college and then went on to further his degree at Clemson University some 250 miles away from his home. Robbie was still a year or more out from graduation. From all outward appearances, he had a lot to look forward to and few, if any, enemies. Robert also had a daughter from his first marriage, Samantha. Samantha and her husband, Samuel, lived just a few miles away in Anor, South Carolina. In one fell swoop, she had lost her father and half-brother. Later that night, she would have to tell her three children that they would never see their beloved pappy again and that their uncle had been slain as well. As police investigators were hard at work, Samantha and her husband would have to make arrangements for a double funeral and settle both men's estates. There were no suspects and no answers to the questions the children doubtless had. It was a tragedy and mourners from the community poured in to pay their last respects to the two men at their August 25th funerals. Life in the community would return to normal and Samantha, Samuel, and the children would eventually put things back in order and move on with their lives again. Somewhere out there, however, the DNA evidence was being processed in a new and revealing way. Othram, an outside DNA lab, began working with the evidence gathered from the cigarette butts and the stocking cap found at the scene of the Ford's burned-out vehicle. While there wasn't a direct match with the DNA on those items that could link it to a single individual, Othram's access to a huge database of collected DNA would give their forensic scientists an opportunity to cast a wide net and find relatives of whoever had left that DNA behind. It would take nearly two years of cross-referencing before they were able to narrow down potential matches who not only were related closely to the mystery man, but also lived in the area. When investigators in Horry County received a list of potential relatives, the close-knit nature of the community worked in their favor. The folks related to the man formed a pattern that pointed to someone they were more than a little bit familiar with, Randy Granger. Randy was a resident of nearby Loris, South Carolina, and he was well known to local police. Over the course of his life, the 53-year-old man had had a number of run-ins with the law. Since he had been 18 years old, he had put together a string of small-time crimes, including breaking and entering, weapons charges, a string of bad checks, burglary, and even a kidnapping charge. He was the kind of mid-level criminal that goes back and forth from jail to home to jail to home. Every community has them, teetering at the edge of doing something serious enough to land them a long stint in prison or finally going straight and trying to make the best of what life has left to them. Sometimes, though, something brings them over a certain line, turning them into something more than just a local bad guy. Was Randy Granger the guy who had gunned down the Fords in cold blood? There was only one way to find out. They had to get a DNA sample from Randy, and they had to do it without him knowing they might be on to him. There's always a possibility that Randy had not acted alone, and if he became aware that he was a suspect, other unknown participants in the crime could just disappear with no traces whatsoever. Detectives would follow Randy for some time, looking for an opportunity to get a piece of evidence that would have his DNA on it. Eventually, they were able to do just that, and the DNA proved to be an exact match to that found on the cigarette butts and the hairs left in that skull cap. They had their man, but was this just a simple killing as robbery, or was there something more to it? There was. Randy had a live-in girlfriend, Teresa Martin. Teresa had a bit of a record herself, mainly for getting behind the wheel of a car after drinking, also for domestic violence and food stamp fraud. And once again, the close-knit community connections would come into play. Teresa, it turns out, was a cousin of Samantha Rabin, the daughter of Robert Ford and the half-sister of Robbie Ford, and the full beneficiary of the Ford's estate. Could there have been a connection? There was most definitely a connection, and there was a weak link in that connection. 
Teresa Martin. As soon as warrants could be arranged, investigators brought Teresa in along with Randy and Samantha. Two years had passed and there was no time to waste in questioning these three. Teresa would crack quickly and explain that Samantha had come to her seeking a solution to a problem. She needed someone to kill her father and that person would have to kill her half-brother as well so they could finally inherit everything her father had. She needed someone who could do the job and stay quiet about it, someone who would be smart enough to cover their own tracks. Teresa said Randy was the guy to do it, and if Samantha promised him $20,000 once she received the inheritance, he would go along with the idea. Randy agreed, and Samantha provided him with the revolver that she had stolen from her father's house a year before. Samantha had been planning this for some time, and she needed the killing to happen before Robbie returned to school. Killing the two men together would make sure there were no loose ends and no chance that she wouldn't have all of the estate. Teresa would tell investigators that on the day of the killings, she had driven Randy to Robert Ford's home and that she had then picked him up when they abandoned and set fire to the Ford escape. Teresa had, without a doubt, implicated the two. How would Randy and Samantha handle their interrogations? Randy, a whipcord-thin man with unruly gray hair barely held together under his ball cap, would be dragged in and placed in an interrogation room. It was August the 17th, 2020, almost two years to the day after the murders of Robert and Robbie Ford. The detectives would let him sit in the room for over an hour before coming to speak with him. It is a common practice that oftentimes chips away at a person's resolve, particularly those who have never really been in trouble with the law before. Randy had been in these situations before, and he just patiently waits. Morning, Randy. Morning. Mr. Randy. Yeah, come sit right here for me. Sorry you've been waiting so long. Can we get you anything? It's kind of cold in here. It is kind of cold Yeah. Here. You want to get you a water, something to eat, you want nope. a soda? No, I ain't here. You good? Nothing at all? Escape. You never seen it. You never seen it before? No. You sure? I ain't never seen it. No? I got a rock suburban. Okay. You never seen that car before? No. Yeah. Sir. That's a skull cap with DNA on it. There's some hair in it. That matches the cigarette butt. That this skull cap was found inside of this car. Well, my uh, my cigarette butt is black. No, that's your cigarette butt. I got your DNA to prove it. The cigarette butt you dropped last week was white. Two years ago, you smoked yellow ones. No, I've only smoked lights. I got your DNA off of three of these that were sitting right outside of this car that matches this toboggan that was inside of this car. I probably smoke that. Okay, well, let's get past the cigarette part. We got your DNA. Even if the cigarette butts aren't yours, the hat's got your DNA in it. We confirmed it last week, so we'll think about it for a second. You sit there and look at these. I know it's a lot. We'll be back in about five minutes. Randy can tell the situation isn't playing out in his favor, and the detectives only give him a few minutes alone with his thoughts before they come back in and put the pressure back on. Alright, Mr. Randy. 
I know you didn't do this by yourself. And I know you didn't just didn't do it on a whim, say, oh, hey, I'm going to go do this. What I want is the person who asked you to do it. I didn't pay you. <laughs> do what? You really want to play stupid. I'm serious now. Because I got you right now for at least two counts of murder. Arson, criminal conspiracy, and a whole bunch of other stuff that can I come up with. For something you didn't even get. For something that wasn't your idea and that you didn't get paid for. I know you were offered a sum of money to kill Robert and Robbie Ford. And I want the person who hired you to do it or asked you to do it. Because that's the only way that this benefits Mr. Randy. Do you understand that? that goes that this whole thing stops there's nothing to help mr. Randy nothing whatsoever we want we want your story the one that's going to shine you in the best light to offer you the best chance with this because we already because hold on we already know what happened Your I'm, DNA, your phone I'm, I'm going to put it to you like this. You said you wanted a lawyer, so that's fine. I know you got hired to do it. I know who hired you to do it. I know how much they offered you to do it. So now you can go sit in jail right next to them when I charge you with two counts of murder, and that's going to get this afternoon. She'll be right there with you. Just yep. So you can say hi to her in the jail. The officers leave Randy alone again for a few minutes. Everything begins to sink in, and now he's on the other side of that moment from two years ago while he laid in wait, the fate of two men's lives in his hands. Now, the fate of his own life hangs in the balance, and he knows it. Samantha Rabin would be brought in next for interrogation, Phone records, financial records, the testimony of Teresa Martin, and the DNA evidence implicating Randy Granger are all weighing down on this moment. Telephone records obtained by the investigators would show some 72 calls and texts between Teresa and Samantha, 24 of which were between 6 a.m. and 9 p.m. on August the 17th, the day of the killings. The detectives know that they most likely have the person who was the mastermind behind the killing. They know that she had the means to do it and certainly the motivation. They just needed her to provide them with some little pieces of information, hopefully something that would incriminate her. All right, before I ask you any questions, just want you to know, we already talked to Randy. And Randy's in jail. Okay. Do you want to talk to us? No. Okay. So how does my lawyer come here? Like, what happened to them? We're going to carry you to general. Your, your attorney would like to come here if you want to talk to us with them present. But if you, don't if you want, want us to call your lawyer to come up here. Oh, well, is that a... I mean, I don't know how... What I'm supposed to do is we call and ask him? Well, like, no, I don't know what I'm it, supposed to do? It says you have the right to talk with the lawyer and have him present with you while you're being questioned. So okay, so if we you can want us talk. to call Stephen, we, we can ask him to come up here. Oh, okay. And talk to you. Okay. Is that something you would like to do? If you want him to, yeah. I mean, yeah. If I want him to, it, yeah. It's up to you. I'd Not rather to ask him what he thinks I need to be doing. Okay. All right. Let us call Stephen real quick. And okay? if he doesn't answer, the next is Michael. Okay. It takes a while for Samantha's attorneys to arrive at the sheriff's office. In all, she waits alone in a room for about an hour. After a short bathroom break, she is led back in, this time with her attorney in tow. He makes it known that the interrogation ends here. All right, um, 
as you know, client's not doing a statement at this time. Okay. So that's it. That's just oh, the okay. formal part of it. Okay. And don't say anything at this point. Everything in this room is recorded, okay? okay. Officer Hafner is going to transport you to Jay Rubin. Okay. Okay. He'll be down here in just a minute. Okay. Talk okay. to you soon, okay? Okay. Just remember, you have to have your All three would end up facing trial. Prosecution was handled by the 15th Judicial District of South Carolina. Teresa Martin would be charged with conspiracy to commit a felony. She would then provide evidence and testify in the trials of both Randy and Samantha. She would plead guilty to accessory after the fact and be given a three-year sentence for her involvement, with time already spent incarcerated waiting for the trial to be applied against her sentence. Randy Granger would be charged with two counts of murder, arson, criminal conspiracy, possession of a weapon during a violent crime, possession of a firearm by a convicted felon, and theft of a motor vehicle. The public defender on Granger's behalf would argue that Teresa's testimony could not be trusted considering her history of crimes that included fraud and lying. The jury was not swayed by the argument, however, and rendered judgments of guilty on all charges for Granger after only two hours of deliberation. Randy would then offer to provide evidence and testify against Samantha Rabin when it came her turn to stand trial. On the stand, he did not mince words and left no doubt that she had been behind the killing. Prosecutors would bring forth evidence that Samantha had benefited financially from the murders. Financial planners and insurance professionals would explain that Robert had an IRA through Edward Jones Investments worth about $100,000 that was supposed to be split evenly between Samantha and Robbie in case of his death. In addition, there was a $125,000 life insurance policy with Robbie as the primary beneficiary a second life insurance policy worth $115,000, and his 401k retirement plan through Fidelity that was valued at over $145,000. The house and adjoining land brought to a total of over a million dollars for the estate. In addition, a joint bank account had been set up by Robert Ford for Robbie and Samantha with an initial deposit of $90,000. A senior vice president with the bank would testify that by May of 2019, only $948 was left in that account. As the lead prosecutor would say, Samantha had a million reasons to kill her father and brother. In the end, even after a defense that tried to blame her own mother, Robert Ford's first wife, the jury would find Samantha Rabin guilty of the two murders. Randy would see a change in his sentencing in return for his testimony, but in the end, the change would only amount to the wording of his sentence, allowing him to serve the two sentences concurrently rather than consecutively. Because of state law, it would still be a life sentence without parole, as explained by the 15th Judicial Court Solicitor, Jimmy Richardson. Uh, as soon as he went to prison, uh, he said, hey, um, I will come back and tell you the rest of the story and testify, and that is that I was hired to do these killings. So what always happens is what's in it for me, you know, the defendant. And what we always say is, look, we are going to uh, keep our word. We will put you in front of the same judge that listened to your testimony. If you help, the judge can lower your sentence down to 30 years if, um, if he wishes to, or he may, you know, may not. But Rand Randy Granger said, yes, I'll do that. And he came in and he testified that he still killed Robert and Robbie Ford, but he says, I didn't know these people. Um, the reason that I killed them was that Robert's daughter, Samantha Rabin, and Robbie's brother, Samantha Rabin, had hired me to kill these two people um, so that she could get um, insurance money, land, all of the stuff that goes along with it. He came in and testified, um, their cousin, her name is Teresa, uh, she came in and testified that she was the go-between between between her boyfriend, Randy Granger, and her cousin, Samantha Rabin. And um, the jury, after a case that actually went into the second week, 
uh, came back and found uh, Samantha Rabin of guilty of both murders, which was interesting. Keep in mind, she was not physically there. She was constructively driving this murder, but she wasn't physically there. Um, they found her guilty of two murders, and they found her guilty of two counts of solicitation to commit murder and two counts of conspiracy. So Judge Culbertson sentenced Samantha Rabin to two life sentences, plus um, the time, I think it was 10 years on um, the conspiracy, um, and it ended up being two life sentences plus 30 years. So it was all consecutive sentences. Uh, and that will come into effect, you know, during all of these appeals. I tell you guys all the time, as soon as they go up there uh, and get checked in good, they give uh, the inmate a pen and, or a pencil and a piece of paper and they start appealing. In fact, even before the week was out, the defense attorney had filed a notice to appeal. Randy Granger came back. Um, he had two life sentences. The judge reduced that to one life sentence. Um, it really doesn't matter that much because in South Carolina now, life means pine box life. You die in prison and then they take you out in a pine box. If you found this case compelling, don't forget to like the video, comment down below your take on it, and please subscribe to the channel. We're on our way to a million and we'd love to have you come along. Also hit the notification bell in order to stay up to date each time we reveal a new shocking case. Until next time, stay safe and keep your eyes peeled. You never know what's lurking in the shadows.